All right. <clears throat> so in our timeline of this course, we're kind of in the 1920s. This is when musical trends changed. Uh, barbershoppers sing a lot of songs from the 1920s, but really, as I've mentioned several times before, in that day, these songs were not viewed as quartet songs at all. Uh, one of the people that was instrumental in really, really bringing rhythmic effects into uh, popular music was James P. Johnson and his uh, famous song, The Charleston, really introduced elements of rhythm that just taking it a step beyond any of the kind of little jazzy rhythm effects of, of Irving Berlin or any of the previous. So this music was the music of the 1920s. <clears throat> and then there was Al Jolson. Al Jolson um, <clears throat> was, was probably the most energetic live performer ever. I mean, he, he scored 100 in presentation every time he took the stage. And uh, 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 what a voice he had. Uh, he, he, ha he began on the vaudeville. He had a minstrel kind of throwback act where he put on blackface a lot of the time. And uh, just, you know, he was a smash uh, uh, in the entertainment world. By the way, all these recordings you hear now are obviously microphone recordings. The microphone came in in the kind of mid to late 20s. That voice you could not be mistaken for anybody else's voice, right? You wouldn't miss mistake that for Bing Crosby. <laughs> okay. Let me move on. Move on. <clears throat> now, here's a horn recording. This is Billy Murray and another recording artist, Ada Jones, singing a duet after you've gone. And by the way, After You Gone was kind of a landmark song because its melody d implies the major seventh chord. Not many songs in the 19, up to that point did. But in the 1920s, you began to hear melodies that absolutely demanded certain chords that hadn't been in the voc vocabulary before. But you can tell, obviously, by contrast, this is a horn recording. That's what the horn sounds like. See what a pop singer Billy Murray was. No formalism, he scooped all over the place and stylized. After you've gone, after you've gone, Leeds, after you've gone, just stretch across, after you've gone, make it real easy, here we go. After you've gone. No way to harmonize the song without that chord, right? That's just, if you, if you avoided that chord, you know, you, you missed the song. All right. Gershwin certainly changed popular music. I really, really love the music of George Gershwin. You know, my top two figures for composing would be Gershwin and actually Stephen Foster. I just think, uh, I think those two just had a flair for writing music. I don't know what it is. But Gershwin was especially versatile, writing classical kinds of things, popular things, you know, uh, musicals. I mean, you know, Porgy and Bess is just a masterpiece. It has so many pieces of music that don't resemble anything. I mean, where did he come with, where did he come up with, it ain't necessarily so? You know, a whole song full of quarter note triplets and just that lyric and that motif. I don't know. This is his famous swoop. Now, this was 1921. 1921. Can you imagine people hearing that in 1921? <laughs> <clears throat> yes. Mills Brothers started off as a quartet. 
Now, they started off as a quartet of four young men, the four sons, the four sons of this man right here. They were from Ohio. Piqua, Ohio. <laughs> Thank you. And this man was a vaudevillian quartet man, at least as much as a black man could be. He sang quartet harmony. And he had four sons that were talented. He taught them all to harmonize. Those four young men <clears throat> uh, became famous as the Mil Mills brothers. Uh, very early in their career on a tour of England, the bass singer uh, died, tragically. And the three continued to sing with their father, who filled in the bass part, for a while. After a while, he got too old. He said, I'm done with this. And the three of them continued as the Mills Brothers trio that we're so familiar with. Here's a little bit of a recording with, with, the, with the dad. And he sang, he sings low X. Largely improvised. I don't think they wrote down much. Here's the four Mills brothers in video, okay? And they are really, really remarkable. This is the four young youths. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mills brothers. Hold that tiger, hold that tiger, hold that tiger, hold that tiger, hold that tiger. Now, this is something that was a movie short. They had movies where the, in the movies they would have a little short for the movie and, and it was a sing-along. So you listen to the song and then it does the bouncing ball thing over the lyrics. Won't everybody sing along using your hands? Don't use a cornet or This is a song that's been barbershop many times, by the way. Come and take a chance with me. Notice the little cartoon that came up afterwards. They started singing for cartoons. A lot of the early cartoons had the Mills Brothers singing. And the first uh, introduction, of the Mills, the introduction of the Mills Brothers to the American public was they were not seen. They were just singing. And when they were first seen, it was a kind of a shock because nobody knew that they were four black young men. And meanwhile, they'd gone to, you know, they'd done tours of Europe. 
Uh, it was okay to be black in Europe, just not in America. <clears throat> okay, um, now, <clears throat> the revelers. Uh, this kind of was the beginning of the, you know, maybe a precedent for the gospel quartet thing where a quartet had five people because they had a pianist. Yeah. And uh, so the revelers were really a quartet, but they had an accompaniment. And uh, you may recognize this guy right here. That's Wilfred Glenn. He's the guy that sang Asleep in the Deep. However, this is late 20s, and they viewed themselves as a modern, more modern, uh, you know, getting away from the old, old-fashioned quartet style. So already the, the style of the peerless in American quartets was, was passe. And this was the new version. However, it's, I believe it's a horn recording. So here we go. Let's listen to this. No, it's not. It's microphone. Cool song. to arrange that for some good quartet. That's great. Some of you young whippersnappers don't get busy. I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> also, that I Ain't Got Nobody. That's a great song. I haven't heard it for years. It's been barbershopped a lot, but what a cool song. <clears throat> okay, now, the, the Revelers inspired uh, this group from Germany. And they were really big stuff in Germany. The comedian harmonists Everybody in Germany knows who they are. Go up to any of the ladies first women and mention the comedian harmonists. They're very famous in Germany and the, the, the memory of them was revived recently by a German documentary. Uh, they didn't sing for a long time because when the war broke out, they broke up. I believe two of them were Jewish and they got the hell out of there. In fact, one of them died in Florida not that long ago. I wish I'd got a chance to to talk to them. <clears throat> but I have a video of them. Here's... They sang some songs in English, some in German. This is kind of barbershoppy. Mostly it was four parts. Here's a video. Here's a video. Uh, this is from some musical review in Germany, and it is in German. It's rather amusing to watch there. <laughs> this guy's funny. You can 
t see that the musical trends are, are changing. This is the Boswell sisters. Uh, this was a remarkable ensemble. They were from New Orleans. <clears throat> And there were three white girls that sounded like three black girls. Uh, and they sang music really in a very barbershoppy kind of style, but without the bass. So it was kind of the Mills Brothers trio kind of thing. And this set the precedent for a lot of girl groups that came later, like the Andrews Sisters. But these women were very, very innovative, very, very good. Uh, <laughs> You get their, their, their material is all available. There's complete works of the Boswell sisters. Uh, anybody interested in our music should get it. They've got just a, it's a wealth of ideas for, for arranging for material. And the lead singer was Connie Boswell, uh, an incredible voice. Uh, Sentimental Gentleman from Georgia was one of their songs, for example. I'm sure that's where Ed Wayshey got it, you know, the idea for arranging that song. I have a video of them. They always sat, uh, stood and sat around the piano. The lead singer, Connie, uh, uh, was uh, paraplegic. Uh, she couldn't walk. What's the word? Yeah. Had hands, but legs didn't work. Um, and uh, that was from polio uh, in, at an early age. So she always sat. And I think she was a pianist as well. So here we go. Let's watch this. This is cool. Now I've been having, been having them all day long. I got to hear it, but I can't go wrong. Cause when I got them, I just roll along. Everybody, while I sing this song, I'm singing about that dance that makes you shake your shoes. That dance that gives you folks the heebie jeebie blues. It's called the heebie jeebie dance. One love, love. It's called the heebie jeebie dance. They just had a lot of, oh, lot of non lyric stuff that was just so cool. Got heebie jeebies, I'm talking about. Now, I don't have a recording of this group, and I don't even know much about them, but they were a, ra a studio, a radio group, and singing around the microphone. So the idea of quartet singing was being carried on. It wasn't so barbershoppy anymore. It was just more smooth 30s harmonies, and this was the beginning of vocal jazz that resulted in groups like the High Lows, okay? <clears throat> this is the American Quartet's last recording, 1925. They were basically washed up by then. The, the, the era of the male quartet, recording studio quartet, it had just been replaced. The microphone came along, and those fellas did not, re their voices didn't sound good in the microphone. Why? Because they'd spent their whole careers learning how to sing this frontal quality for the horn, and then when they got in front of the microphone, it just sounded harsh. And plus, it wasn't cool anymore. And this is full of instrumentation. It was kind of the, their last gasp, you know, trying to hang on to things. So it's full of special effects. Goodbye, blue, 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 bl
Quartet, this is the final version of them. I don't have a recording. Uh, taken 1926. They hung on till 1928. And this was a completely different Peerless Quartet. Because at some point, Henry Burr just got a new group thinking he could carry on and make it in, the, in that day and age, but it didn't work very well. They were, they were done in 1928. And even that was probably two years beyond their you know, financial viability. So, at the turn of the century, everybody had a parlor in their home. It's where you sat around. There was no radio. There was no TV, obviously. Uh, entertainment was not every night. It was whenever the vaudeville show came around. So most nights, we don't understand this, you know, most nights there wasn't anything to do. You came home from work and there you were in a house. Uh, and so you, you talked and you engaged in musical activity. But of course, life was changing in the 20s and 30s. And it became essential, first of all, to have, you know, very desirable, have two incomes. Women were becoming professionals, all right? And so people came home from work and they were tired and didn't have a nice dinner waiting for them. Um, and uh, also, entertainment was changing. You come home from work tired, let's go to the movie. So you watched or you listened to the radio, the radio was on. You know, there was a president of the United States with a fireside chat or something. And, uh, or, or many, many comedy programs that were on. So what people did with their spare time changed pretty drastically through the late 20s and into the 30s. And it, so this old tradition of harmonizing, it waned. Didn't disappear, but it waned. It certainly was not there so present in American society, such a fabric of American society as it had been at the turn of the century and into the early part of the 20th century. So, there you have it. Now, here's a quartet that hung on. They were the Maple City Four. And they sang on, so station WLS Chicago had a program called the Barn Dance. Anybody remember that? Saturday night barn dance. Saturday night barn dance. Okay. It was a live show, but it was on the radio. Right. Kind of like the Grand Ole Opry down here. It was. was. The same yeah. Okay. My mom and dad always listened to the barn dance. There were certain things I listened to, you know, they were old people's things, but I remember them so well as a kid. They always watched Lawrence Welk, and they always listened to um, the barn dance. <clears throat> and I remember some of those. I could mention names that would mean absolutely nothing to you. But one of the early uh, performers on the barn dance was the Maple City Four. Obviously a barbershop quartet. I don't know if they called themselves that or not. Probably not. But they also were quite well known. They also sang in some movies. They were in, uh, you know, some movies with Gene Autry, for example. So here's the Maple City Four. I
See, they sing the cleaned out version. There's a piano very faintly in the background, very faint. You might enjoy this tag. Gene Autry movie, singing cowboys. <laughs> he's acting like he's not enjoying the music at all. <laughs> now, what did Henry Burr, the lead of the Peerless Quartet, do? Well, he became the dean of the ballad singers on the barn dance. And so he was the guy that came and sang the old songs like he used to sing them back when his quartet, back in the day. All right. So Peerless Quartet, thing of the past, here's their lead singer singing songs that they used to sing. <clears throat> Glenn Howard, the guy that had the Capital Quartet, Capital City Four, but the guy that had the Oriole Quartet, I showed you their quartet card, yeah, from Illinois. His quartet got to be pretty well known around Illinois, and at one point, they invited him to come up to Chicago and sub in the Maple City Four because one of their singers couldn't make the show. And he went up there and sang with the Maple City Four. And he, will, he would never forget that. And here's what else. On the show was Henry Burr. Now this is a guy from Illinois that had grown up listening to these records of the Peerless Quartet, stealing the arrangements off the record. And that was far away New York City. And here he was meeting the recording artist that he'd listened to all his life. Can you imagine that? This is the Illinois Harmony Club. There was organized barbershop. They didn't call it that. They called it Close Harmony in Illinois, a thriving community. There were groups meeting in several little towns in central Illinois and a thriving group in Chicago. That's why when our society began, many of the early champions were from Illinois. So we're talking about spontaneous barbershop activity that happened during, I call this the dark ages of barbershop. You know, there was still the Maple City Four and a few groups singing, people were still harmonizing, but it just wasn't the national phenomenon that it had been 20 years earlier. So there were still people doing it. That's important to understand. It never died. There's my characterizing features again. I, I post that periodically, just to remind us, these seem to be characteristics of barbershop in all ages, in all ages. I think this one, number four, got limited a little bit along about 1970, 1980. But that wasn't historical. That wasn't historical. So, by the late 1930s, the barbershop quartet was mostly a thing of the past. And the music that you're hearing right now was what people were listening to. And it's quite likely, it's quite likely that uh, when Cash and Hall met, this was what was played in the lobby, something like that. So it was quite different from the music of the previous generation. You'd have to say that the transformation from 1920 to 1940 was a huge transformation in American society. So, here we have it. This is O.C. Cash. Uh, he was brought up in, actually, Oklahoma. When he first moved there, uh, it was not even a state. It was a territory. And his dad uh, was one of the leading city citizens in this rather wild country. So anyway, uh, they, they, uh, they've tried to form a night school for adult education so that, uh, you know, the people could learn. A lot of people couldn't read or write. And uh, Mr. Cash, O.C.'s father, 
Squire Cash was entrusted with trying to organize that. And so he was trying to get a teacher, and uh, one day he was standing in the general store talking to the owner of the general store. You know, they were talking about uh, who was going to teach the night school, and in walked a guy. He was actually a hobo that had been kicked off the railroad. And he walked in and heard, overheard the conversation. And so this is a famous story many of you are familiar with. And, and O.C. Cash says, uh, uh, and, uh, said, well, are, can you do this? He says, I can teach. So Cash decided to test him out a little bit. He says, well, is the, is the earth round or flat? And the guy says, I can teach it either way. <laughs> so Cash says, you're hired. And, and uh, so that guy taught night school. Now, they had a different subject every night, history, reading, you know. One night was music. <clears throat> and uh, this fellow, his name was, uh, what was Jim Wiley. Uh, and he taught people to woodshed. And he taught them to find all four parts of the chord. So if you're singing along in a song and you get to a place where people couldn't find the harmony, he used what was called the bung-bung method. You, you, so basses go bung on your note and then the next part goes bung, 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 you know, just to arpeggiate so people could hear where they were supposed to be, find a note in the chord. And that was, Cash said, how he learned harmony when he was a kid. Now the unfortunate ending of that story is that one day the feds walked in and carted this guy away and it turned out he had escaped from a penitentiary. Oh, <laughs> so anyhow, Cash had grown up singing and, and this was an era when the barber's shop was like a men's club and men would hang around it and they would harmonize. There's Cash's picture as it appears. I think that ha picture is still hanging uh, in the entryway of our new Harmony Hall. Is that true? That's the conference room. Yes, as well he should. This is Rupert Hall. Uh, Rupert had grown up in Iowa, had attended school at Creighton University, uh, was a businessman. Again, reminisced about singing barbershop harmony in the barbershop. So he, like Cash, cherished these memories and you know, missed the old-fashioned kind of harmonizing that they used to do. Now, they met in the Muehlbach Hotel. The Muehlbach Hotel is in Kansas City. It's still there. And they were both traveling, were both businessmen. They were both stranded because the weather was bad, their flights had been canceled. So they were stuck a night in Kansas City that they hadn't planned. So there they were, and they just ran into each other in the lobby. They were not close friends, they were acquaintances. And <clears throat> at some point, well, they, let me get the story right. First of all, they went down into the little pub area. Now this lobby is a big grand area, and right down, if you walk in the main entrance, right down a stairwell to the left is a little pub. So they walked down there, and they talked. And um, Cash says to Hall, uh, can you sing tenor? And Hall replied, as a matter of fact, I'm the best tenor in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so Hall, Cash tested him out. I said, okay, sing along with me. And he sang, you had a dream. Well, I had one too. He sang, you had a dream. And Hall harmonized a pretty nice tenor up there. And uh, he was pretty good. So they uh, uh, sang for a little while right there in the pub. And at some point they said, well, <clears throat> wouldn't it be great if when we got back to Tulsa, we got some people together and just harmonized in the style that we both used to do. And they agreed that they were going to do that. After that, they went back up to the lobby and they found two other people who could harmonize and they went up to somebody's room and they spent the evening woodshedding. So that was the encounter that triggered this whole thing. 
And this was a chance meeting. If those two guys hadn't run into each other in the lobby, there may never have been this revival movement. Now, how many of you have been to the Muehlbach lobby? Okay. Anybody who hasn't should make that pilgrimage. While you're there, you can go to Arthur Bryant's barbecue. It's my favorite spot on the globe. <laughs> and here's a story about the mule box. So this is kind of like our Mecca. Um, and um, uh, that hotel, I remember going to Central States District uh, in, you remember that. Well, you, not in Central States, but did you ever go to, were you ever in Central States at, way back when? You're mid-Atlantic, right? Okay. I remember going to Central States when the, that was the headquarter, headquarters hotel for the district. This was back in the 80s. At some point, uh, a new hotel was built catty cornered across the street. It's right on 12th Street, the famous 12th Street of 12th Street Rag. Uh, catty cornered, Radisson builds a new hotel. They buy the Mule Bach. They decide the old one's gonna get torn down. So for years, for several years, it was slated for demolition. Now, on the spot where Cash and Hall had met, there's a plaque, a plaque that our society had placed in the 1960s, commemorate, commemorating the place where really our society began. Um, <clears throat> however, that lobby was cleared out. And at some point, one of our former society presidents, Gil Lefholtz, the late Gil Lefholtz, who lives in Kansas City, lived in Kansas City, decided we better go in there and rescue that plaque. So he went in there, but everything had been cleaned out and, and the uh, plaque had been stripped away. And so he asked them, because they had given him permission to come in and retrieve it, he said, well, where might it be? And they said, well, all of the furniture and all the rooms is in these big old rooms in the basement. It's just piled up. It's just junk. And he said, well, can I go down there and look? And they said, well, yeah, you can if you want to. And so there were these rooms and rooms of junk down there. And what are the chances? But Gil said he opened the first door and right there on the top of a pile with a light shining down from heaven <laughs> and music playing in the skies was the plaque. And he climbed up there, retrieved it. It went to our headquarters in Kenosha for several years. Then at some point, the Radisson decided not to trash the, to demo, demolish the hotel. They decided to renovate it. And that lobby, that beautiful old lobby, got renovated. And now it's not used as a lobby anymore, but you can walk in there. The plaque is back where it used to be. And somewhere in the late 90s, we had a follow-up ceremony. And I was there, actually, and gave a little talk. And we put another plaque below the plaque, saying this is the date when we reinstalled the plaque. And this is the place where. So if, when, we used to, when we had Harmony College in St. Joe, Missouri, a bunch of us would go there on Sunday after Harmony College pay homage to the plaque, sing You Had a Dream and a few other songs, and then go get barbecue. That was part of our routine. Anyway, if you find yourself in Kansas City, don't miss the opportunity to just walk in there and look at the lobby and the plaque. And the little pub is still down there. It's, again, it's not used as a pub. These, I guess it's, this is used for private parties nowadays. So you can walk down there and look in the door is a glass door and see the pub where they sat down there and harmonized you had a dream. So anyhow, the meeting that they had talked about having, and by the way, we don't know the date of that encounter. Nobody ever recorded it. They didn't remember it. It was sometime early in 1938. So here on Wednesday, April 6, 1938, they are setting up their meeting. Now this is obviously written by Cash because he had great humor in the way he wrote, kind of like Sigmund Spaeth. So in this day, age of dictators and government control of everything, so, you know, uh, this was the age of Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal, so there was all this stuff happening. Uh, about the only privilege guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, not in some way supervised or directed, is the art of barbershop quartet singing. Without a doubt, we still have the right of peaceable assembly, which I am advised by a competent legal authority, includes quartet singing. The writers have for a long time thought that something should be done to encourage the enjoyment of this last vestige of human liberty. Therefore, we have decided to hold a song fest on the roof garden of the Tulsa Club on Monday, April 11th at 6.30 p.m. 
That now is Barbershop Quartet Day. It's a, got a national designation, and they've actually had quartets on the Today Show or Good Morning America on April 11th. Signed, Rupert Hall, Royal Keeper of the Minor Keys, <laughs> O.C. Cash, Third Assistant Temporary Vice Chairman, a title he maintained till his death in the 1950s, except he added the word permanent in front of it. So it's permanent Third Assistant Temporary Vice Chairman. <laughs> now, Cash had a disdain for any kind of bureaucracy, you can tell by reading that, uh, bureaucracy or governance or anything. So he viewed all you know, officers, meetings, things like that as, as, as uh, you know, undesirable. The thing we were here for uh, to do is sing. Now that meeting did happen. <clears throat> and you can read on April 11th, when we were to meet, fine warm spring day, Roop Hall was there first, went down to arrange for the feed. They had food, okay? Donnie O'Donovan of station KVOO, Elmer Lawyer of the Tulsa Paper Company, and I were uh, the next to arrive. Three of us were standing around when S.M. Puny Blevins, well over six feet, showed up. None of us knew him very well, but when he asked, what are we waiting for, we had a quartet. Blevins sang lead, O'Donovan tenor, cash baritone, and lawyer bass. O'Donovan suggested down mobile. And though Blevins didn't know the lead too well, that was the first song ever sung under society auspices. That quote from Deke Martin. Let's sing it, shall we? Key of B flat. society song right there. <laughs> Tag probably added later, I don't know, who knows. Now this was the first meeting and this was a newspaper article. So you notice barber shop, two words, harmony, the thing of the past, SPB, SPPBSQSUS is formed to preserve it. And you see, you can see what kind of day and age we were in. There was something about the Nazis, there was something about the Florida uh, New Deal test, and um, so those are the times. World War II is brewing. All right? It's a little, little hard to read, but there's some funny things in the article. We won't, we won't dwell on it. We could spend a long time reading that. Now, this was a, maybe a second or third meeting. And this was in the Alvin Hotel. Uh, different place. Maybe they needed a bigger space. <clears throat> At that first meeting, they had had such a good time, they decided, and by the way, there was no intent at that first meeting that this would be a regular ongoing thing. It was just, we're going to get some people together to sing. But they had such a good time. And somebody shouted, when are we going to get back together? And somebody else said, how about tomorrow night? And, and they said, well, okay. So they set up something a couple weeks later. And so this was at a different place, Hotel Alvin. It was hot by now. Summer was setting in. And uh, the windows were wide open, no air conditioning. And the sounds of these guys harmonizing was floating out on the, on the street. And it was causing a traffic jam. So a policeman... <laughs> was down there trying to keep people moving along and up runs a reporter thinking and says, where's the wreck? And the policeman says, there's no wreck, it's just some damn fools up there singing. <laughs> so he runs up to the second floor and walks in and there's Cash. 
and Cash recognized the reporter. He wants to make a story. So the reporter says, is this a national movement? And Cash says, well, the correct answer to that was no. But Cash says, yes. He says, I've got a buddy in, Can in Kansas City starting it there, and I've got a f uh, there's a guy in St. Louis starting it there. And he mentioned a fellow named Ed Everett Baker, who was a railroad executive in St. Louis. And he said, that guy is, is starting something in St. Louis. And so the reporter went out and wrote up a story. And it mentions that groups are going to be starting in St. Louis. And it probably mentioned Kansas City as well. Well, Everett Baker read it in the newspaper. And so he calls up Cash and says, What's, what are you doing to me? And Cash <laughs> says, well, I had to say something. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to advance this thing. So, and by the way, would you mind? So he got a group together in Kansas City. Meanwhile, a group had also gotten together, uh, I'm sorry, in St. Louis, in Kansas City. I believe Kansas City actually has priority. So uh, a group started very early in Kansas City, in Oklahoma City, and in St. Louis. That was the first three cities where something outside of Tulsa happened. I don't know in which order. Probably Kansas City first, um, uh, Tulsa or maybe, maybe Oklahoma City, maybe St. Louis, I don't know. I don't know, it's hard to know. Um, but in any case, uh, this article went out on the Associated Press. So now it wasn't just local, it was all over the country. And everybody was reading about this thing that was going on in Tulsa. And of course, lots of people were still interested in harmonizing, they had done this. Well, it hadn't been that long since it had been you know, a national thing. And so they get all kinds of inquiries about this new organization. In fact, there wasn't an organization. Uh, but Cash and Hall would respond and just say, yeah, we got together, you should get together. Uh, and then they traveled a lot. Both of them traveled a lot. So when they would travel to a particular city, if they were in Detroit, they would get with the people who were interested in Detroit and show them how to organize a meeting and you know, maybe had, give them a few songs to sing. It was all very disorganized. In fact, it was so disorganized that, you know how when, something starts up, at first everybody's really happy about it and they think it's a lot of fun, but about the time you have your 10th meeting, you may be kind of running out of things to do and it gets to be the same. So even within the first year, it sprung up and some groups had petered out. So it was decided that the next year they should have a convention to bring it all together, to get people there, to organize, to have a formal organization, and so that's what they did. <clears throat> now, this is what Cash <laughs> sent out. <clears throat> I, I, I hate to read this because it is not politically correct. So, Kim, hold your ears. In the first place, you need a vacation and some relaxation. You haven't been looking so well lately. Now, you've attended conventions before. What did you get? Listens to a mess of dry speeches, reports of committees, and heard meaningless resolutions read. Then you reach your room exhausted and tried to organize a quartet. And what a failure that always is. The only thing about a pickup convention quartet that has ever organized is the singers. The purpose of our society is to organize the harmony. In other words, to give people something to sing. Have you ever participated with 2,000 men, 500 tenors, leads, baritones, and basses, and busting I Want a Girl wide open? No. Then you have a thrill coming. There will be few speeches, if any, at Tulsa, June 2nd and 3rd. Just harmony. Harmony until the tenors drop in their tracks. So get up three or four of your cronies together, rig up this trip, come by plane, train, or covered wagon, but come. Be extremely nice to the little woman from now till June, but if she doesn't soften up, do as I do. Just give her a good stiff punch in the jaw and come on anyway. Ooh! Oh, I didn't write that. Okay, when you cut to Tulsa, I want to show you the baritone to Mandy Lee. I am the only baritone in the United States who can do it correctly. Now, if you mugs don't come to this party, the next time I see you, I'm going to kick your britches right up between your ears. Affectionately, O.C. Cash. So, I should say that the beginnings of barbershop society are rife with sexism and racism. There is no hiding it. This is history class. We're not going to hide it. We don't claim it. Every fraternal group was that way. We can hide behind that if we want to, but I, we, we should choose not to. But there were no blacks, and women were treated not equally. And jokes like that were OK. Terror is not OK anymore. <laughs> Okay, so we're not going to hide anything here, but that was the invitation. 
pretty funny. <laughs> Sometime later, 1938, the Kansas City chapter was born. This is Cash blessing the Kansas City chapter. So they had their convention. 1939, a year later. First part of June, June 2nd. This is funny too. Yes. Arrival of first trains. We'll start busting them at the Union Station and as other choo-choos, buses, jalopies, planes, and covered wagons heave into sight and we'll keep on until the last songster gives up and goes home. We'll harmonize in hotel, hotel lobbies, restaurants, stores, banks, taxi cabs, and on street corners. Here's Cash's disdain for the business meeting. Business session, very brief. Election of national officers, etc. <clears throat> the story is that at that, that meeting did occur and Rupert Hall went up to use the men's room and came back to discover that he was the society's first president. <laughs> 8.30 a.m. The necessary evil of registration will take place on the mezzanine floor Hotel Tulsa, convention headquarters. Barber shoppers will be vaccinated, car tagged, and tattooed so they can be returned to the herd if lost, strayed, or stolen. Formality of reserving hotel rooms in which no one will sleep will be handled. <clears throat> Here's a good one, 5.17 a.m., sunrise. Some rise, some set. <laughs> oh. Now, this is pretty good up here. Prizes and awards, <clears throat> the winning quartet. Title of world's champion barbershop quartet with official rights to all emoluments, gratuities, appurtenances, and benefits appertaining thereto. Certified by the credentials establishing this claim in all countries of the world, including the British Empire and its colonies in the North and South Poles, but accepting the Nazi Reich, Latvia, and the Principality of Monaco. Commissioned to each member as colonel in the staff, the Honor Honorable Leon C. Red Phillips, Governor of Oklahoma. Audition for movie or radio purposes. Suitable cash prizes. <laughs> Second best, World Championship Barbershop Quartet runner-up title with all rights credentials at all. Uh, adoption of each member into the Pawnee Indian <laughs> tribe. <laughs> movie or radio audition, suitable cash prize. <clears throat> the also rans, a box of throat lozenges and best wishes for the next convention. <clears throat> so here's the rules. Here's the contest and judging manual right there. Eight rules. You can read only amateur are, avail, uh, are only amateurs are eligible for prizes and awards. Um, championship competition restricted to quartets, male, with or without accompaniment. Oh. First two contests said that nobody recalls that anybody ever used accompaniment. After the second one, it was required that it be a cappella. Uh, so you can read down through those. Here's interesting. Quartets will be known by to judges by number only. <clears throat> Costume and makeup will be permitted but not required. Fee for the entire convention, a mere three dollars. <laughs> what a bargain. Okay, so there was a contest. Cash insisted, now this is significant too. So Cash, you know, they had to have a business meeting, blah, 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 get an organization, set up dues, you know, Chap, you know, structure for chapters, for local chapters, all this stuff had to be done. Um, but Cash's insistence was that the main event be a quartet contest. And I think I may have mentioned to you before, I can't remember what I said in which of my history classes, the, the tradition of a quartet contest was not new. There had been quartet contests in New York City, in the parks, uh, for years, going back to the 1920s. So the, not the notion of quartet contests was not a new thing. Cash knew about these contests, and he wanted this convention to feature a quartet contest. So the main event is, and still is, I think, the quartet contest. Even though we have chorus contests, and that's a big deal too, I think we can safely say that our main event is the quartet contest. Oh, yeah. And it always will be. Okay, now, this quartet contest happened, there were some 50 competitors. Wow. It's not all that different than what we have today, the very first one. 
And the judging, the judges panel consisted of some dignitaries. And one of them was the governor, Red Phillips of Oklahoma. This was the Phillips of Phillips 66. And um, after hearing these quartets, they actually asked for a sing-off. There were two they thought were at the top. One was the capital city four that had come from central Illinois, Glenn Howard, who didn't even bring their costumes because they didn't think they were eligible to compete because they were not a barbershop quartet. They didn't represent a barbershop. That term was not under intelligible to them. But it was quartet harmony, so they came to see it, not to compete. Cash heard him in the lobby. Did I tell this story there? Yeah. Cash heard him in the lobby, and he said, not only are you going to compete, I think you're going to win. And Glenn Howard and a reporter heard that. Glenn Howard showed me an article in Springfield, Illinois newspaper that said that the Capital City Four was expected to win the first national quartet contest. And they almost did. They almost did, because they were part of the sing-off. The other quartet was the Bartlesville Barflies from nearby Bartlesville, Oklahoma, who, by the way, were under the auspices of Philip 66. <laughs> so after hearing both of those quartets sing again, they selected the Bartlesville Barflies. So they're at the top of our list of champions. And uh, one of the judges says it was that they only won by a 64th note. And um, uh, some of the Illinois contingency, because there were some people from Illinois, including a, a, a little cocky little guy named Doc Nelson, who was kind of a coach and mentor to the Capital City Four. He didn't like that decision very much, unlike today where everybody's always happy with the judges' decisions. <laughs> and he grilled the judges about it. And one of the judges finally said, well, you know, I think what it was was that they had those nice uniforms and red neckties. And they're the capital city four hadn't even brought their uniforms. So if they brought their uniforms, maybe they would be at the top of our list because it was close. But of course, they were under the auspices of Philip 66 and there was Leon Phillips on the judging panel who knows whether that affected anything. Okay, here's our first champions. By the light, by the light, by the light of the silvery moon, of the silvery moon, I want to spoon, I want to spoon with my honey I'll prune, love to honeymoon, 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 keep a shining in June. <laughs> you are silvery beams will bring love. Little woodshed harmony there, I think. We'll be cuddling soon. We'll be cuddling soon. <laughs> By the <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so you can tell the harmonies kind of hit and miss. Um, <laughs> probably woodshedded. Uh, now, now the question may arise, did these quartets use written arrangements or not? And the answer is both. Some did. That, that, that sounds to me like it was woodshedded. They just missed too many notes for any arranger to have written it. But some of the quartets did. There was a book by Edward Smalley that had been published. There was Sigmund Space book from 1925 that had been published. So the written arrangements, and there were people arranging the music, you know, very simple manner. Um, so anyway, um, <clears throat> there, were, there, there were people that were singing written arrangements. And very early on came some pretty sophisticated things, like we'll hear the, the Bye Bye Blues bell chord. That came from the early 40s. That was clearly worked out carefully, you know. So there was a lot of written arrangements. There's the bar flies in their western getup. Now here's the medal, our current medal. Uh, the AIC was insistent upon keeping our complete name there on it. Um, and that was designed as it now exists in later in the 1940s. It was given to the early champions retroactively. There was no rule against competing again. 
the Bartlesville Barflies came back the next year, and then the next year, and they were called the Philip 66 Barflies. <laughs> they never won again. Uh, the third champion was the Cord Busters from Oklahoma City, I believe. Some of you may remember Tom Massengale, who was the base of them. He lived until mm, maybe 12, 15 years ago. Um, I talked to him many times. He was a great guy. But that quartet decided not to compete the next year. So the next year after they were champions, by their own choice, they just sang at the afterglow in hospitality rooms. They did not compete. And that set a precedent that was honored by the quartets through the 1940s. Sometimes towards the 19, uh, at the end of the 1940s, it was made into a rule. 